Okay, uh, we are back. <laughs> Uh, if you are regular to these sessions, you'll know that I haven't been around for about a month now. Uh, this is my first online workshop in about a month. And uh, hopefully I still remember how to do these things. <laughs> um, as you're joining us today, please do feel free to share in the chat where you're joining us from. Uh, and you're welcome to share what you do with WordPress. Uh, morning to you too, Valerie. Top of the, top of the day to you as well. Um, it is, it is kind of cool to be back. I... Uh, I didn't plan on being away for an entire month, which was only going to be two weeks. Um, but uh, I, um, let's just say I had some back trouble. <laughs> uh, I'd injured my back before I went away on my trip. Um, and I was treating it with anti-inflammatories and painkillers. But uh, I didn't realize the severity of the injury. Uh, I only discovered that when I got back. So I had to spend a week, two weeks in recovery. <laughs> which was not fun. Um, and I'm now finally this week sort of 95% back. So that's one of the reasons it took so much longer to catch up. Um, hey, Dash, joining from Virginia. Welcome. Dash works in higher education. That's awesome. Uh, hey, Jean. Good to see you again. Jean's in New Jersey. Uh, hey, Adrian. <laughs> um, Adrian says, I wondered if you'd made sure I was uninvited. <laughs> I'm going to leave that one alone. <laughs> uh, um, hi, Arthur from Frankfurt. Uh, I'm going to assume that I pronounced his next name correctly, Javier. I, I assume that's correct. From Navarra, Spain. Welcome. Uh, I was in Spain. I don't, maybe we met in Spain. I was in Spain for my for my work trip. Javier, were you at the at the meetup in, in Malaga, perhaps? Let us know if you were there. If you're not, all good. Let us know if you were there. Uh, welcome, John from Chicago. Uh, we've got Shit from San Angelo, Texas, works in an agency. Um, great, got a got a wide range of folks here today. Um, so very quickly, an introduction to myself. If you don't know me, my name is Jonathan. I live in Cape Town in South Africa. Um, I'm currently a developer educator at Automatic. I always say currently because, you know, things can change. So it's just perfect with currently. I hope it doesn't change, but that's currently where I'm at. Um, and I'm sponsored to work with the training team, the WordPress training team. Um, and we do various educational things like these workshops and tutorials and various other things. Um, and I'll be honest, these workshops are probably the best part of my day, best part of my week, because I get to to chat to other folks and share, share things with other folks. Um, and today and for the rest of the year and maybe even into next year, um, we're going to be looking at some of the new things that have been coming to WordPress over the course of the last few years. Um, so the focus of these workshops it's going to change slightly. Um, it's going to be a little bit less formal, if you will. Um, previously, my online workshops were sort of very structured and very formal. Um, these are not going to be so structured and formal purely because I'm going to be working with things that are either still under development or coming soon or just been released. Um, so it's going to be a little bit more mad experimenty, uh, which we've done a few of those in the past, and a little bit less sort of looking at older legacy things. Um, and the main reason for that is that the training team has embarked on a new project, which is going to be our focus for the rest of this year and at least the first half of next year. And I wanna share this link with you. Um, we're going to be developing learning pathways for Learn WordPress. Um, so let me just hide this welcome box and let me share this link with you in the chat. Um, and the Learning Pathways project is essentially a way of making the content on Learn WordPress more formalized, more focused, um, with a bit more of a guided pathway into learning a specific topic. So we're going to have very specific user-facing learning pathways, designer-facing learning pathways, and developer-facing learning pathways. Focus, should I say. Facing is maybe not the right word. So if you are a brand new user to WordPress, you will start at point A, and then you will follow the very structured steps until you get to point Z, and then you will have learned everything you need to know about how to use WordPress. If you're more of a designer and you need to go a little bit deeper than the average user, you will have a point A to start with, which some of it will be similar to the user point A, some of it won't, and you will then go through a specific progression. If you're more of somebody who wants to develop with WordPress, maybe you've done the user and or designer pathways and you want to dive into developing plugins, developing themes, contributing to core, 
you know, doing all kinds of complex integrations, there will be a specific developer pathway and you will start at point A and end at point Z. And so because we're working on this more formalized structure, um, it allows those of us who are running these workshops to be a little bit less formal with our workshops, um, which allows us to be a bit more creative and hopefully make them a bit more interesting. Um, so those are going to be that is going to be my focus moving forward. And so this week, I'd like to chat about a new API that has come to WordPress. It's called the HTML API. You may have read about it. You may have seen it. Um, it was initially shipped with WordPress. Well, the initial version of it, I think, was shipped with WordPress version 6.2, which was about two versions ago. Uh, and there were some updates with version 6.4. So we're going to kind of dive into it today, have a look at how it works, what it does, um, and why you would why you would need to use it. Before we do that, let's dive into a few announcements just to kind of set us all up. So again, welcome to everybody who's joining us. Um, I don't have a co-host with me today, so please bear with me if I have to do things like check the chat or admit folks and things like that. Um, please let me know if you can't see my shared screen. So right now there should be an announcement slide on the screen. Um, if you don't see that slide, please let me know uh, and I will re-enable the screen share. Or at any point in time, if you lose the screen share, let me know. You shouldn't see a bunch of just a bunch of faces. You should see my shared screen at all times. Um, we are presenting, as always, in something called focus mode. What focus means is I can see all of your video screens, but you can't see each other. This just helps protect folks. We have had one or two issues of Zoom bombing over the years. So this just helps protect us from anybody who might try and do that. Uh, if you would like to enable your videos so that I can see your face, you're more than welcome to, but there is no requirement to do that. You're welcome to, to stay hidden. I don't mind. Uh, I get paid to be on, on camera, but you don't, so you don't have to. <laughs> um, you are always welcome to ask questions. You're welcome to ask them in the chat. I see that Crash has actually just said he can't see anything, so let me re-enable the screen share while I'm chatting. Um, so you're welcome to ask your questions in the chat. You're welcome to unmute to ask questions. Um, I don't mind either way. If you do unmute to ask questions, the only thing that I do ask is that you, if your question doesn't specifically pertain to what we're doing on screen at the time, you keep that question for the breaks that I allow for for questions. Um, otherwise, you can just post in the chat at any time and I will break and follow up on most questions. Um, Crash, if you, Crash says dummy, I love your nickname, by the way. <laughs> um, if you could just confirm, can you see my screen, shared screen now? I have re-enabled the screen share, so let me know if you can see that or not. Okay, moving on to announcement slide number two. Um, if I start rushing off and going too fast and running through things too quickly, please do let me know in the chat or unmute and say, hey, slow down. Um, I don't mind being told to slow down. I do sometimes speak too fast. Uh, I, I think I have gotten better at this over the course of the last year and a bit, um, but there's always room for improvement. Um, Crash says maybe a permissions problem. Okay, maybe try a different browser. It could be a permissions problem. I've never accessed a Zoom session in the browser, so I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to help you troubleshoot there. Uh, my recommendation would be to use the Zoom client if you can. Uh, I believe the Zoom client works better than, than accessing this in a, in a browser. So try with a different browser, that might work. Um, usually re-enabling the screen share fixes that problem, but let us know how it goes. Um, but then on that note, uh, Crash Test Dummy, for your own purposes, um, we are recording this session. Um, so if you if you are unable to watch this now, you can watch the recording and the recording will have the screen share. Um, we also, I paste the links to all of the code, all of the links that I share in this chat. So I have had folks in the past who've been able to follow along just by listening and opening up the links that we work with. Uh, my slides are literally just the introductions and then the list of links. And all the code that I do on screen, I share in the chat, all the links I share in the chat. So we could probably make it work that way. Uh, but we will be, we are recording this and it will be posted to WordPress TV afterwards and on YouTube, by the way. Um, if you didn't know this, and this might be a good time to share this with you all, WordPress does have a YouTube channel, uh, which I'm going to see if I can find now. Um, uh, WordPress, it's probably not going to come up here. Uh, I'm not going to find it now, am I? Uh, flip. Let's try. Let's just try YouTube WordPress. That might be it. Probably should have got this link beforehand. Oh, there we go. It is just YouTube WordPress for looks good. Um, so this is the link, and all of our videos that get hosted on WordPress TV also get uploaded to the WordPress YouTube channel. So it's it's kind of like once it gets uploaded to WordPress TV, then within about I think a couple of days it gets uploaded to, to YouTube. So if you prefer to watch these things on YouTube, you can get hold of them there. 
Um, it's always weird to me when one of my workshops or one of my videos comes up in my YouTube feed because I'm subscribed to the channel. And it's kind of weird to see my face pop up. But uh, if you prefer using YouTube, uh, you can go and, and check it out that way. So I do recommend checking that out. I'm going to add this to my slides now so that I remember to add it next time because I want to let folks know about the YouTube channel. Okay, um, what are we doing today? As I mentioned, we're looking into the new HTML API. We're gonna briefly discuss the problem that it's trying to solve um, by looking at a slightly real world example. It's probably not the, the best real world example, but it's an example that I have experienced before. Um, and then I'm gonna dive very briefly into alternate solutions that I have used in the past, that I've seen others use in the past to kind of solve the problem. Uh, so some of these might be familiar to you and we'll kind of discuss pros and cons to both. And then finally, we'll get into the HTML API, what it does, how it works, and the pros and cons of using it. Um, and then right at the end, there's some, some links that I'll share with you uh, where you can read up about it. Um, because it's so brand new, there isn't a page in the common APIs section of the developer documentation yet, but there is a code reference. Uh, there is a class reference in the code reference, so you can go and read up about that. Uh, I'm hoping to work on a page in the, in the common API section in the near future, uh, but there is enough information at least on the code reference page for you to read up about what it can do and how it works. If you would like to code along with me today, or if you're watching this video on WordPress TV and you want to try out these experiments yourself, you can do. Uh, the only thing that you will need is a local WordPress installation of your choosing, one that you can edit the files so that you can edit the themes and the plugins and all of that kind of thing. Uh, you will then need a text editor of some kind to edit those files. I use uh, Visual Studio Code in these sessions because it's free and open source. Um, I use PHP Storm otherwise, but that's a paid product, so I don't like to use it in these sessions. Um, and then there's a custom image plugin that I'm going to be working with. So if you want to install this plugin on your local site, you can do. It's not a very big plugin. Um, it's just a few lines of code. It basically adds... I'm going to hit download there. I think I've already got it on my desktop. Um, it basically adds two custom image blocks to your, to your block editor, uh, but you can download that and install that on your local WordPress site. If you are on a Mac and you're running Safari, uh, when you use this direct download link, it might try and extract the folder to your desktop or wherever you're downloading it. So I recommend using a Chrome browser to do the download, or there's a way to change those settings in Safari. Um, you might just have to read up about that. But I recommend using either Chrome or Firefox or something like that just to do the download. All right, I'm going to get up uh, my local environment set up. So this is my local WordPress install. Um, I don't have any plugins installed at the moment, I don't think. Nope, no plugins installed. So I'm going to add that new plugin by going into the plugins page, clicking upload plugin, and I've got it on my desktop. So there it is, WP Learn custom image, and I'm just going to Move, move something so I can click on a button. This Zoom video window always gets in my way. There we go. So I click on that button um, and that's going to add the plugin. I'll click install now. <clears throat> and it uploads and it installs and then I can activate the plugin. Um, and as I mentioned, all the plugin does is add two custom blocks to the block editor. So if I go and create a page now, uh, I'm going to create a brand new page. I'm going to call it my new page because I can't think of any, any decent names. Uh, and then I'm just going to grab some, some random text somewhere. So there's this thing called lorem ipsum um, that you can, it's ipsum.com, I think it is, or lipsum.com, one of the two, I can't remember now. Um, if you've built, no, it's not that one. It's lipsum.com. If you've built websites in the past, I'm sure you've used this, this site before. If you haven't, it's a great way to generate some, some random fake Latin text. Um, one of the agencies I used to work for, we used to use the lyrics to Vanilla Ice's Ice Ice Baby. So that's another way to do it. <laughs> um, but I'm just going to pop some, some random text in here. Um, and then I'm going to add one of my custom images. So I'm going to click on the Add Block button, and I'm going to type in Custom Image. And you'll see that it's there are two images that this block exposes for me. The one is a custom image with a class and the one is custom image without a class. For now, I'm just going to add the custom image with a class. Um, it's, a, it's a picture from another site that generates images of a pair of shoes. Um, I literally chose the IDs randomly. So this is, this is not my shoes. <laughs> These are not my shoes, um, but that's the page. So we've got some text, we've got some image. This is a page in, in the block editor. I'm sure we've all seen what this looks like. 
Then I'm going to save this page and I'm going to preview it on the front end. Um, and if I inspect this image, you will see that the, let me make the HTML editor inspector a little bit bigger. Let me bring this down here. Um, here we go. You will see that what it does is it adds a div uh, with the block custom block class, and then it adds an image tag to the div. There is the link to the image. It's using the pixum.photos uh, image generation site. It has a class of default. It has a placeholder alt tag. And then there is this data hyphen image hyphen class attribute. Now, if you've never seen an, an a HTML attribute like this, this is something we often used to use back in the jQuery days. Uh, we would add like data hyphen ID and then we would store the ID there and then we would use that to get the ID and do something with it. Uh, it's basically, you can, you can define custom attributes on HTML elements. Uh, and so this is a custom attribute that we're using with some information. So this is something that you might generally see um, in a site in the wild anyway. All right, I'm going to take a break there now and just check if anybody has any questions or if anybody's still busy getting up there, getting up, getting their local environment set up uh, before we dive into why we might want to look at, at doing this. Um, Adrian says, how did you get the image? So it's it's another um, image, it's a ge image generation site similar to the Lipsum site that I was using earlier called Pixum.photos. Um, so if you go to Pixum, Pixum.photos, um, you basically just, you can pass in the URL pick some photos and then just the um, dimensions you want and it'll randomly generate an image of that dimension. You can also, ah, oh, puppy, you can also specify an ID um, and using the ID, then you can get an image of that of that dimension. It's similar to another site that I used to use called Placehold It. Um, Placehold It though is kind of boring. It just gives you an image with, let me see, there's an example here. You can do uh, different types. Um, but I just, I just found personally, I like the puppy on my home page. I like animals. So that's what kind of got me to use this one. Um, uh, but it's, yeah, it's any kind of image generation that I'm using. Um, so if you have a look in the code, let me share the code with you very quickly. Uh, let me pop into the plugin code here. Let me learn custom image. So this is the source code. You'll see that the block with the class, uh, find, there it is. I'm just, I'm literally just hard coding that image into into the image tag being generated. Dash says there's also place kitten. <laughs> what? <laughs> Why did I not know about place kitten? Oh my word, I have to go and see this now. Sorry, I love cats. So I have to go and see this now. Uh, Placekitten.com. Um, Dash, you have just changed my life. I will be using place kitten from here on in for all of my images. Thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, I do love animals, but I do like cats more. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Can I just stop the workshop here and we just stare at kittens all day? <laughs> all right. <clears throat> no, we're here for a reason. Okay. So let's talk about a possible problem that you might have. So let's say somebody is building a site or has built a site and you're hired to do some customizations for the site or you're building a plugin that does certain things. Oh no, Adrian's just shared Donut Ipsum and that's going to go down a rabbit hole. I'm not even going to look at it. <laughs> and and let's, say you, let's say you're building a plugin that needs to take every single image on a specific page, for example, and it needs to add a specific class because there's some functionality you want to trigger. Uh, maybe it's in JavaScript, maybe it's somewhere else. But every single image needs to have a class, um, and you need to be able to apply this class to every single image. Now, for good or for ill, <clears throat> when a WordPress post or page saves the content, it stores that content as raw HTML. Um, if, you, if you didn't know that, uh, now's a good time to, to understand that that's what's happening. Uh, I can show you that very quickly. Let's actually go, I don't expect you to do this, but I'm going to quickly go into the database of my of my local site uh, and show you that I'm not, uh, correct username and password would be helpful. And just show you that I'm not necessarily talking through the hole in my head. So let's go to learn press, let's go to posts. It'll probably be the last post on the page. Uh, there's my new page, there it is. Uh, and there you can see, let me just double click on this and make this a little bit bigger. There you can see the, the code that is being stored. So this is essentially what's known as block markup. Um, I'm going to copy this out and just pop it into a 
into a file so we can see what that does. Uh, let me just create a new HTML page here quickly. And you see, this is why I said these things are a little bit more experimental. Uh, Page.html. So this is the block markup that gets stored in the database when we save this page. And you'll see it's using these um, block tags, which are HTML comment tags with the name of the block. So they're opening and closing tags. Uh, but then inside of the tags, it's essentially just standard HTML markup. So this is a paragraph. Let's actually format this a bit better. There we go. So this is a paragraph tag with text in the paragraph. This is a standard div with a standard image tag inside of it um, with various attributes. And then a closing div. This is all standard HTML. And this is how WordPress stores the content in the database when you're working on po pastes, pastes, posts or pages. Um, the pro there are pros and cons to, to doing it this way. The pro is that if the block editor ever falls over, it's still HTML, it'll still render on the front end. The downside is you're storing a lot more of the of the layout in the database than what you maybe should. And there are arguments against, you know, for and against both options. This is the, the decision that WordPress has made. Um, and this is what, what we're working with. So if I wanted to build a plugin that applied a specific class to all of the images in any post or page or wherever, I'm going to need to be able to work with this HTML. So let's say the requirement is I want to find every single image on a page and I want to add a class called new class to that image. There are a number of ways I can do this. So the first way that I could do this maybe would be to use some JavaScript. I could, every time the page loads, I could wait for the page to load and then I could run through all of the image tags and apply the class to it. That's one option. Um, so let me show you what that would look like just so you get an idea of it. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to create a brand new plugin in this site. So in the plugins directory, I'm going to create a new folder. And I'm going to say WP learn HTML API.php. This is my main plugin file. Oh, sorry, it's supposed to be a folder. <laughs> I stopped. Um, there we go. And then inside of this, I'm going to create a new PHP file. And I'll just call it WP learn HTML API.php. Uh, and this is the file that will load whatever functionality I need to do. Then if I want to do this in JavaScript, I'm going to need a JavaScript file. There are many ways that I can store my JavaScript file in my plugin. I can put it inside of a JS folder, inside of an assets folder, inside the root of the plugin. Um, because this is just an example, I'm just going to stick it in the root. And I'm going to call it WP Learn HTML API.js. So that's my very simple JavaScript file. And then the JavaScript code looks a little something like this. This is a very simplified version of what it is. Uh, make that a bit bigger. Um, but essentially what it's doing is it, it uses the document event listener when the DOM content is loaded event. It then calls this anonymous function, which essentially uses the query selector all method to select all uh, elements with the IMG tag. And then it loops through all of those images and applies the new class to those images. So you may or may not have done something like this in the past. I certainly have done things like this in the past. I've, I've applied things to elements in JavaScript. Um, that's kind of what that code could look like. Uh, let me oh, share that. Bad. They're not scanned yet, though. Sorry, was that a question? My bad. Mother Nature had called. Oh, sorry. <laughs> cool. Um, so to to make this all work, I'm going to relatively quick. Yeah. So to make this all work, what I'm probably going to need to do is Sorry I'm going to that. need. To... Yeah, no worries. <laughs> I'm going to need to enqueue this in. Well, the, it's my the fault originally for not having it ready. Sorry, the, I'm not sure yeah, who's yeah. chatting right now. Are you asking People me a question or a few are you billion on the dollars, phone? Man, they could, they could afford it. Might be on the phone, yes. All right, now nah, it'll be mad quick. Let me see. Look, there's. Okay, <laughs> I think he was on a phone call there. All good. Um, all right. So as I was saying. Um, to get this to work in the in the scope of a WordPress site, I'm going to need to do what's called enqueue this JavaScript in a plugin. Um, if you've if you've never seen how to enqueue a plugin in JavaScript before, I'm going to share the documentation with you. The function you would use is this wp enqueue script function. 
Um, I'm going to share that in the chat now as well. But this code, what the code looks like is something like this. So inside of the PHP file, uh, first of all, I'm going to need a plugin header. So that looks, looks a little bit something like that. I'll share that with you in the chat. Um, so it opens up the PHP tag. It sets up the plugin header with a plugin name and description if you want it. There's various other things you can do as well. Um, and then you can also do something like this. You can check if the abs path constant is defined. If it isn't defined, you can exit, meaning if this is not running in the scope of a WordPress site, don't run the rest of this code. Then you would do something like this. Uh, you would use the WP NQ scripts action. So you would say add action WP NQ scripts, um, and you would then define your own callback uh, function to run. Button. Sorry, I'm just gonna. If you're if you're on the phone right now, um, I think your mic is enabled. I'm not sure who that is. Uh, would you mind just muting your mic if you are on the phone? There we go. Thank you. Um, okay. So you hook into the WP NQ scripts action, you define your own callback function, then you need to specify the callback function. So it looks something like this. You say function, the name of the function, open close brackets, and then you set up your function code. And then you use that WP NQ script function that I shared with you earlier in the documentation. And you do something along the lines like this. Um, I will dive, dive into this quickly with you so that we understand what it's doing. It's basically saying NQ the script file, give it the handle WP learn HTML API, the file path of the JavaScript file we want to use, you can, there's many different ways of doing it. This is one way you can say, use the plugins URL and then build it and take it and put it on top of that. And then that's the file to be rendered. You can specify an array of dependencies. I'm not specifying any at the moment. Um, and then what I like to do during development, I'm gonna copy this quickly into the chat so that folks can see it if they need to. What I like to do during development is I like to specify the time function as the version number. Because what that means is every time the PHP code executes, the time function will update, give it, a, give the code a new version number and refresh the cache. So if I'm making changes to JavaScript, it's an easy way of busting the cache. Um, when the code is done and I'm ready to distribute it, then I'll change that version from time to a proper version number. So that's what the code looks like. This is very, very sort of simple and I'm not you know, worrying about security and things like that right now. I'm just enqueuing this JavaScript file for WordPress. And then this is the JavaScript file that's running. So if we do that, we would now expect to see the new class um, class <laughs> being applied to all our images. So let's see if this actually works. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to activate this plugin. So if I go to my plugins page, there is the plugin that I created. I'm gonna activate that. All good, that's activated. If I now go back to the page that I was testing and I hit refresh, I, sh I should see the change happen. So let's refresh that. And if we inspect the shoes, we now should see a change. So I'm gonna move some things out the way so I can see. And there we go. So let's make this a bit, yeah, where's my little, oh, there we go. So there you can see it is added to the default class. It has added a new class. It has done what we've expected it to do. Okay, so that's great. It works, wrap up, job done, move on. <laughs> um, there are however some downsides to doing it this way. Um, so the one downside is that you're now applying this to every single image across the entire site. And you might not necessarily want that to happen. You might want it to only happen on content images, for example, um, or various things. Um, also, the other downside is that because this is happening on the JavaScript side, it means that first the page has to load. And then once the page is loaded in the JavaScript files, then the JavaScript files and it makes the change. And we didn't see any problems with that on our very simple example, but if you've got a whole bunch of images and a whole bunch of content and a whole bunch of JavaScript, then you end up in a situation where you might see what, what I think is called the flicker, where the image or the content or whatever loads, and then there's a sort of a change when, when something happens, when those classes are applied. Maybe the class applies a background color or some other visual functionality. Um, so while this is one solution, it might not be the right solution for, for your environment. Um, Tremi says, I would prefer the function file time over the time function. We'll take the last modified time of the file. This will work with the cache. Yes, that's definitely another option. Um, th there's many ways to do it. Um, it's just a personal thing. I like using time. I'm, I would never, I would never leave either of them in a production environment. It's purely, um, a local thing. 
So yes, that's that's definitely an option. Uh, it's up to personal preference. Okay. <clears throat> um, so that's one option. One way we can look at it. One thing we can do. The other more sort of effective option is to handle this on the PHP side. Um, so what you could do, if if you, let's say your focus is, I just want to make this change to any any images inside of content, inside of page or inside of post content, I want to make that change. Well, WordPress has this lovely filter called the content, um, which runs every time the content is sort of generated. Um, and you can hook into the content filter and you can apply something to the content. So first of all, you could use that to say, well, if I just want this to, to be applied to, to the content of posts and pages, this is the perfect thing to do. So number one, I'm limiting the scope of where this is being applied. Step number one. So to do that, I'm going to remove the NQ scripts code and I'm going to add filter because I want to hook into the, it's a filter, not an action. Um, and then I'm going to also define a callback function. So in my case, I'm going to define it as just WP learn HTML, the content. Um, as you can see, I don't have the best naming conventions in the world um, for my example code. Um, and then I'm going to need to define that function. So WP learn uh, API, the content. And this callback function will receive a variable that contains the content of any postal page. So the content, the content filter always fires when a page or a post is rendered. So I will always get the content of that postal page. To verify that for ourselves, what we can do in this code, and I'll share it with you just before we run it, is you can do something like this. You can say echo PRE tags, and then you can uh, print R the content and pass in true, which will, I can't type today. Print R, there we go. So you can echo that. So print R is a way of printing a variable. When you pass true as a second parameter, it passes back the result and doesn't output it to the screen. Um, and then you can close that with PRE tags, uh, or at least close the PRE tag. Now it'll be nicely pre-formatted and you can see the information inside of there. So this is just one way you can check what's happening in the content variable. There are other ways you could log it to a file, you could do various other things. But for now, we just wanna keep it nice and simple. We wanna be able to see it on screen. If you come to my, some of my workshops, you've seen me do this a few times before. So if we now refresh that page, okay, it's kind of it's kind of at the top here. We can't really see it because it's HTML, but if I inspect this, um, you will see that there is the PRE tag, and then there is the paragraph, and then there is the div with the image. So that is getting just the content. Um, which is exactly what we want to work with. Now we're not working with the whole page. We're just working with the content. You see, it's the same content that we stored, same HTML content that we use. So that's great. That's that's already better than trying to do it to the whole page. But now you have a couple of options. And one common option that folks use is something called regular expressions. So if you've never worked with regular expressions before, I'm going to show you an example of what that could look like. Today's workshop is not about regular expressions. So I don't want to dive into how they work and what they do. But essentially, a regular expression is a way of, there's like a special kind of formatting that you can use that you can pass to the, the regular expression functions that says, if the code matches this regular expression, then I want to make some changes to it. Um, and there's many different ways that you can do it. But the one simple way would be to use what's known as the pregreplace replace function, which is a PHP function which performs the regular expression and then does a search and replace. So what this code is doing is it's looking for image tags with a class using, and it's doing various other things and checks and whatever else. And then it's saying return the existing class, the one that's currently there, with and then, and then add the new class that I want to add to it. And I'm not a regular expression expert, so I don't know what all these other tags do. So if you do know what they do, that's great. You can let us know in the chat. But the other, the other characters are, are performing additional sort of functionality to perform additional checks using the reg regular expression. But it essentially says, look for all image tags with a class and then add the new class to the content and then return the content. So that's what that is doing over there. So let's see what that does. Let's see if that does what we expect it to do. Let me share this with you in the chat so you can grab it if you need it on your side. And let's have a look. 
So if we refresh this now and we inspect the shoes, we should see that there it is, the default new class, the new class class has been added. Great, win. Um, and regular expressions are a very common way that developers use to make changes to HTML attributes. There are a couple of downsides to regular expressions though. Uh, so let's talk about the upsides first. The upsides are regular expressions are very performant. They're very fast. Um, if you get the right regular expression and it does the right matching, it's going to be very quick to do the regular expression search and replace. So if you're having to work through lots of content, it's a good solution. The downside is if you look at this regular expression, I can already see one problem, and that is what if the image tag being rendered is using single quotes instead of double quotes? Well, then you need to build that into your regular expression check. Um, the other example is, uh, I'm going to just check something here quickly. <clears throat> what if, in this case, what if your what if your image doesn't have a class attribute? So let me show you what I'm talking about. Um, if I go back to my page and I go and add the second custom image block, so it's custom image without class. That's a picture of some some photos. There's some books. Um, if I inspect this in the editor, you will see that the image tag being rendered does not have a class being applied. So now when I save this code, or at least this page, should I say, let's save the draft, and then let's preview that, and let's have a look at what happens to that image. So you see what it's done is it's actually added the new class to the data image class attribute. And if you look very carefully, I'm going to make this a little bit smaller so it'll actually show us what's going on there. You'll see it's actually kind of broken the data image class attribute. It's added a space there. Um, so now it's a data image attribute and then a class attribute. So it's kind of broken the original image tag. Uh, hopefully you can see that in the window. If you can't, let me know and I can share it with you. In fact, we can probably make it a little bit bigger here. There we go. So while regexes are great, um, they're, 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 I've used regexes for string searching. So when I'm searching a specific string, uh, one example that I used it for was when I was working at Castos, which was a podcast hosting company. Um, we were receiving um, data from various different podcasting RSS feeds that had, that had different formats of different files in the file name sort of URL string. Um, and I had to write a reg regular expression check that would basically just focus on the, the proper MP3 path of the file. Um, and so there, in my opinion, regex was the perfect solution because I'm always going to expect something to have a certain format, end with .mp3 and then ignore everything after it, any query strings that were, there were query strings appended to some URLs and some weren't and all that kind of thing. So in that instance where I'm working with strings, I, I believe regex is still a perfect solution. But when it comes to HTML and when it comes to some of the things that HTML allows, for example, custom attributes that can have the word class name, um, I'll share some other examples with you in, a, in an article towards the end of the session, regular expressions can be brittle. Um, so they're very, very fast, but they generally only work in certain circumstances where your HTML is very defined and very specific and doesn't have a lot of extra things going on. Okay, so that's regular expressions as an option. Any questions on that? I'm going to take a quick sip of water before we dive into another option that is possible. Uh, but any questions on, on what we've covered so far? Adrian says, for what it's worth, my spec code looks very different. Low class added and it's a figure tag. Ooh, what theme are you using? interesting and you've and you've added the custom image blocks not a standard image block <laughs> yeah so if you add a normal image block in wordpress it'll add a figure tag and that's the correct way to do images um but uh, the, the custom image blocks from my plugin are the ones we're working with today um so so let me try those <laughs> So if you if you're unsure where those are, when you add them, if you once the, once the custom image plugin is added, you should be able to type in the word custom image, and they should come up one with and one without. Um, so have a look at that. Okay, but thanks for thanks for asking. Maybe someone else is having a problem. Um, all right. So let's look at a more 
<laughs> I almost wanted to say more better, a better way of, of doing something like this. And that is the PHP DOM document functionality. Um, so I'm going to share this with you in the chat. So PHP, the DOM document class, is something that was released way back in PHP 5 sometime. Um, it was a way to represent an entire HTML or XML document. And it has the capability of working with that DOM document and making changes to it as needed. It is very similar to the way you would do things in JavaScript when you're working with a DOM. So if we go back, I think I still have that JavaScript code open. So let's open that quickly. Um, so JavaScript has this query select all method that you can use to find yeah, method to query all, all elements in the DOM. Um, the DOM document class in PHP has a similar way of doing things. Uh, I'm going to scroll down and find the, the relevant, where am I now? Just find what I'm looking for here. Yeah. So go down to the table of contents. So there is a get element by ID, which is very similar to the JavaScript one. There is also get elements by tag name. So you can search for elements by a specific name. Um, and then once you get those elements, you can loop through them and make changes to them. I'm not going to dive too deeply into how that works and the way it should work and what you should do. I'm rather just going to show you the code that you might use in this example and kind of talk you through it. So I'm going to take out the regex content at the moment, uh, and I'm going to share with you what using DOM document might look like, and we'll talk about what it's doing and how it works. So I have used DOM document in the past as well. Uh, funnily enough, both both the JavaScript and the regex and the use of DOM document was all while I was working at Castos um, because we were working with HTML content of podcasting files and podcasting plugins and podcasting players. Um, so it was all, all in my time there. Let me share this code with you in the chat as well. Uh, this, is in, this is now the updated code inside of the learn HTML API, the content function. Essentially what this is doing is it creates a new instance of the DOM document class. It then calls the load HTML method, and you can pass it in um, a full HTML document or just in our case, the content, sorry. Then you can say, get elements by tag name. Uh, and you can say, pass all the elements to me. And that'll give you a list of images. You can then, this list of images is an array of objects. So you can then use the PHP for each loop. You can loop through these images, and then you can use the set attribute method and you can say, I want to set the class and apply new class. Then finally, you say doc save HTML, which then will return the updated content. And then because this is a filter, we need to return the content. I deleted that earlier. So let me share the updated version with you in the chat. Little side note, whenever you're working with a filter and you're making changes, you always have to return the updated version of whatever you're working with. So that's what it looks like. Um, a little bit slower than using regex, but a little bit more effective. So you're always going to find all image tags, and you're always going to set the class attribute for those image tags. You're not going to have any problems with it doing it in the wrong place or doing the wrong thing. So let's have a look at how that works. Um, if we go back to our front end, we've now got, at least I've got those two images on the page. Um, so let me refresh that. And now if I inspect those images, we will see that the first image has, let me move this over so you can see. It's the one, there's the one thing I hate about inspectors. It doesn't format the HTML too nicely if there's not enough space. There we go. So there we go. There's the first image. It has the new class applied. So that was the image without a class. So it added the class for us, which is great. It doesn't care whether it's single quotes, double quotes. It, it adds that attribute for us. But then here's the, the second one. Um, you'll notice that what it did was it overrode our default class. So it didn't add it, it overwrote it. So we need to do a different thing where we maybe do an add class or a had class or whatever, but at least the functionality is, is better. We're not breaking things down and we're not causing trouble. Um, so so that's, that's your third option. Now, the one downside with DOM document is, go back to the code here, is number one, it's more memory intensive because it reads the entire HTML document that you send it into a tree um, and then it sort of stores that all in memory. And then you'll notice this last uh, call here, the save HTML call, essentially rewrites everything from the memory. So 
while you're looping through your tags and doing things and making changes, it writes it into memory and then it rewrites everything back from that memory to your content variable. So it's more memory intensive, which means if you're doing it a lot, if you're doing it in a number of places, it's going to be less performant than the regex solution. However, it is a better option because you can do things like set attributes and all those kind of things. Um, I think there is an add attribute option uh, in the documentation. Let me just find it here. Maybe there isn't. Um, set attribute. There probably is a way that you can, what you would, so what you would need to do is probably get attribute or something um, and then update attribute or something along those lines. So it is definitely possible, but it requires a little bit more work, a little bit more knowledge about how it works and what it does and all those kind of things. So up until WordPress 6.2, those were sort of the three options available to you. Um, create attribute, somebody mentioned. Let's have a look here. Yes, there we go, create attribute, thank you. So you would need to check, does it have the class attributes? And if it does, then create it. If, it. if it does, then add it. If it doesn't, then create it. And you'd have to do some additional checking and code and all those kind of things. Thank you, Chet, for pointing that out. Um, so the pro is it's a lot better. It's a lot less chance of things going wrong. The downside, it uses more memory, is quite a bit slower than using regex. So now we get to WordPress and the new HTML API. So as I mentioned, the HTML API was originally released in WordPress 6.2. Um, and there was an amazing article uh, last month. And this is what kind of, this article is what kind of got me into, oh, what is this HTML API and what does it do? Um, and Mary Baum, who's the person who, who, who wrote this article, says the HTML API process your tags, not your pain. <laughs> Um, and so I do recommend reading this article. I've used one of the examples from this article in this workshop today, but there are some other examples there as well. Mary dives into some of the problems with using uh, regex, regex, reg, sorry, regular expressions. Sorry. <laughs> um, and then there's also a comment in the in the comments about using DOM document. And Dennis, who is the original developer of the HTML API, discusses those those arguments. Um, but essentially, the HTML API is built around this HTML tag processor. Uh, and what the tag processor does is essentially it's very similar to, let me find the, let me find the class reference rather. That's a better one to look at. I'll share it with you. It does something very similar to what DOM document does, but in a faster way um, and in a, in my opinion, more human readable way. So it uses functions like next tag and then set attribute, which we which we understand. Um, but it also has things like, uh, let me just find some good examples here. It has the word, just simple, add class. Um, adds a new class name to the currently matched tag. Um, get attributes, get tag. It's, it's a little bit more human readable. It's a little bit more simple what it does and a little bit more understandable, number one. The other thing just to be aware of is because it's a brand new HTML, it had, sorry, brand new API, it does have a currently a limited set of functionality. Um, but the functionality that is there is very robust and well tested. Um, and it kind of fits in terms of in terms of um, memory usage and performance, it kind of fits in between regex and DOM document. So it's not as quick as regex, but it's much quicker than DOM document. And it's it's not as maybe accurate as DOM document, but it's way more accurate than regex. So it's a good in between middle ground. So let me show you what using the HTML API might look like. Um, and this, as I mentioned, this example is in the article that I shared with you earlier. So you can also check it out there. Um, but this is the code. As you can see, number one, it's a lot less than the DOM document version. So essentially, I set up a new instance of the HTML tag processor, and I pass in the content straight away. And then I can say, while processor next tag image. So in other words, keep looping through all the image tags until you don't find any more. So this is very similar to that for loop. Um, the next tag method returns true if it finds an image. That's why I can use the while loop. So I don't have to first get all the images. I can just go straight into a while loop and say, while you find it, keep finding it until you stop finding it, and then stop. So it reduces my code. Then it does processor add class. Simple, nice and easy, add this class. I don't have to define a specific attribute. I can just say add the class because that's what I want to do. 
Um, and then finally, instead of rewriting it from memory, all it does is it returns the updated HTML. So it just takes the HTML. It does something called tokenizing, um, which is a programming term for sort of taking your code and turning it into sort of variables. Um, but it only updates the changes that you request. And then it returns the updated version. It doesn't have to rewrite it again from memory. So that's why it makes it less memory intensive and more performant. So it's less lines of code, number one, which I always like. <laughs> number two, it's more human readable, in my opinion. Um, it's specifically been designed for WordPress-like environments, but also specifically to follow the HTML5 spec. So it will ignore things that are valid in HTML that might be wrong. And I'll show you what I mean in a second. Um, and as I say, it's aimed to be as performant as possible. Um, unfortunately, not as performant as regex, but way more um, accurate than using a regex. So let's have a look at what this does now when we refresh this page on the front end. So if we have a look at our first image, we will see it has added. This is the image with the class of default. It has simply added new class to that image. So it didn't have to know whether the class default was there or not. It just said add a class. And then if we have a look at the second image, <clears throat> we will see that it's also just added the class of new class. So it knows that there wasn't a class attribute already. It adds the class attribute and it adds the new class that we ask it to add. Um, so it's because it's sort of designed for WordPress and designed for HTML5, which is what WordPress supports. I don't know if you've ever looked at block markup, but it's all HTML5 valid. Um, it's been designed in such a way that if you ever need to make any kind of changes to HTML code in a WordPress site, it is now the recommended way of doing things. Um, I love the fact that with this simple example, I can I can make the changes that I want to make without having to worry about, does it have the class? Does it not have the class? Am I using the right regex? Am I using single quotes, double quotes, whatever? It doesn't care. It just says, take the image. Let me go back to the code. Take the image and add that class to it, whether it has a class attribute or not. Um, you'll notice it didn't break. Uh, let's go back here. It didn't break the data image class attributes like the, the regex did. Um, and it's specifically designed to fix a lot of these problems. Now. One of the other resources, and, and Shelly, I saw your question there. I'll get back to you in a second. One of the other resources that I wanted to share with you, and these are all on the last slide of the slides anyway, is the developer of the HTML API, Dennis Snell. He did a developer hours workshop as an introduction to the HTML API. Um, I was able to attend a similar version of this workshop at my, at my work trip recently. And he, what I liked about his workshop is he dives into some of the really weird and wonderful ways that HTML can be valid, but weird to look at. And let me show you one example from that article. Um, so if we go back to the, if the article over here, if we scroll down a bit, I want to show you this. Um, I didn't know this, but it is perfectly possible to put it greater than or an equal, uh, that's greater than, I think it is less than sign inside of a title attribute, for example, and that's still valid HTML. But the minute you use any of those tags in a regex, it's going to cause things to break. Um, and Dennis showed us a few other examples of this where things are valid HTML um, and, and therefore using regex can cause those to be problems. Sometimes they're valid HTML that probably shouldn't be valid, or at least maybe they weren't designed to be valid, but they end up becoming valid. Um, Okay, so Shelly said, can you write it to work only on posts or on a custom post type? Um, Shelly, that's a great question. Um, I seem to recall, let's actually, this is going to cause me to dive into core. Um, the content itself as a filter, I'm so annoyed now because I used to know this. Uh, let me find the content quickly. Okay, now I've got too many pages open. Find that one. Give me one second here. I'm pretty sure there is a filter that can filter on posts only. I think it fires before the content. Um, let me just see where the content happens. The content happens in post template. WP includes post template.php line 256. Um, and this is this is another reason why I changed these workshops to be a little bit less formal. So we can spend time diving into these kind of things. <laughs> um, so WP includes, what was it post template? Um, oh, I've gone past. 
post template. Uh, the title, oh, these are called from here. Um, okay, so if you're using the content that's normally used inside of a, uh, oh yes, that's the other thing you can do. You can do that. So here's what you can do. Let me just find the content quickly. So here's what you can do. So the content calls get the content. Um, get the content will get the post. So what you could do is you could use something similar in your code. Um, and inside of your the content folder, you could do something like this. You could say, get the post based on the global post. You just wouldn't pass that in, I think. And then you could check the post type on the post. And if it's just a post, you can return. Or if it's just a page, you can turn to it that way. That's one way of doing it. Um, the other way you might be able to do it is I think there are, I think there is another filter here. Let me just check for a second. Uh, it's been a while. No, there's the more link. No, there isn't an additional filter. I thought there was. Um, so your best bet then would be just to call get post. Because if you look at the if you look at the um, the documentation for get post, if you if you don't if you don't pass anything to get post, it'll default to the global post. So in the scope of your the content filter, you can do it that way, and then you could you can even just take that out, and then you could check where the post is a post or a page. Uh, you could do it that way. Um, I don't know if that's hundred percent right, but I think I've done that before. I think you can check whether it's a post. I think it's the post. Yeah, you then get the post type on the post. This is going to bother me now. Uh, let's go find out. Uh, post. Yeah, it would just be the post type object. I think uh, the post type property. Let me see here. Give me one second, folks. Uh, what am I going to do? I'm going to just buy post type. Can you tell it's been a while since I've done something like this? <laughs> And let's refresh that. Yeah, so that tells us it's a page. So that's one way of doing it. Um, I th think that if you do it that way, it's probably not going to have any performance issues because you get in the global post anyway. I don't know if there's a bet. There might be a better way. But off the top of my head, that's the first way I can think of doing. So you would then check if post, post type is page or post and do it accordingly. You could also then do it on a custom post type. So you can check post type. Chris says get current screen works for me. That's another way. Um, you can use get post type. That's another way. Get post type, I think, just calls post anyway and then returns the post type. So that's another option. Uh, so yeah, there's multiple ways to do it. Um, definitely. So thank you everybody for input on that one. Um, okay. Is singular could also work? Yes. That's very possible. Um, yeah, any any one of those that, that checks what the current global post is would, would be an option on, for you there, for sure. Um, awesome. Cool. Well, thank you, everybody, for your input there. I'm, I'm, it's, that, that's one of the wonderful things about WordPress is there's many different ways to do the same thing. Um, I always default to get in the global post, but yes, there's loads of other, other functions we can use. So thank you for that. Um, OK, cool. So the last thing I wanted to share with you is just kind of um, some more reading around the HTML API. I have shared some of these links already, but I just want to kind of go over them again with you. Uh, so let me close all of this down here. So the first one I do recommend is the, um, the blog post. Um, that is kind of a good overview of what it does, how it works um, from a very sort of beginner friendly point of view. The second one would be the developer hours that, uh, that Dennis ran hosted by Michael. Um, and then finally, the actual HTML processor class reference. Definitely read through that, check that out. Um, because what's nice about this page is anytime some additions are made, because this HTML tag, this HTML tag processor, the HTML API is going to continuously be worked on and added to as new functionality is required. So this will be the best place to get the latest and greatest information. Um, Dennis has been doing a great job of keeping this page up to date uh, as new functionality is added. So do keep an eye on that um, for future updates. Awesome. And then the other thing I'd like to mention, and uh, Dennis shared this with me when I chatted to him, is if you ever are finding a situation 
where you need to make a change to a different type of tag, like an iframe tag or a script tag. Um, that's another perfect example of using the tag processor. Because as you can imagine, if you're needing to add some attribute to a script tag and you break the script tag, then you break all the code that is going to be running with that script tag. Um, so whenever you need to make changes to HTML, think about how you're going to do it. Think about the pros and cons as we discussed. I'm not saying you must use the HTML tag processor for everything. Uh, I'm a firm believer in knowing all the tools available, just as we had with knowing all the functions available to check the post type. Know all the tools available and then find the right one that works for your environment, for your use case. Um, but the HTML tag processor is a new and exciting addition to, to WordPress. Um, it's one that is, as far as I can understand, it was required or requested by block developers um, who were extending other blocks and wanted a way to process HTML on the front end. Um, and that's where the sort of impetus for this came from. And Dennis has really spent a lot of time on making sure it's performant, making sure it's HTML5 uh, specific and valid. Uh, so do check it out, do play with it. Um, take a look at some of the examples um, and then send feedback. Um, there are some links to, to in the, uh, where is it now? In this article, um, right at the bottom, there are some links to where changes are being made that you can follow. Um, let me just scroll down to the bottom here. Even talks about yeah CSS classes, all of that, uh, some more resources, all these things that I've shared with you are all here. Um, and then there's a GitHub tracking issue uh, where where they're sort of tracking all of the changes that are that are there. Um, and any this has been closed currently, so any new changes will probably be added and then and then merged in the future. Okay, any other questions around all that? Any other comments? Uh, anything anybody wants to say uh, before we before we call it a day? And have some water while I wait. <laughs> all right. Thank you all for joining. Um, it was lovely to see many of you again. Uh, and the new folks who are joining us for the first time, you're very, very welcome. Next week, we're going to be diving into an API that I have been wanting to play with um, for a long time. And it's the Interactivity API. If you've never seen the Activity API before, I suggest going to check it out because it does some really cool things. Um, but next week we're going to be diving into it. We're going to be learning how it works. I don't. I, I was. This was another workshop that I attended recently. Uh, I still haven't figured it out for myself. I still haven't played with it. Um, but if you if you want to see how it works, there is a um, there is a demo of what is possible with the interactivity API that I'm going to share with you. Um, it's this live movie site. And I high, I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to click any buttons, but I highly recommend checking that out because kind of the functionality that it opens up on a WordPress site is kind of really cool. Um, and so that's what we're going to be diving into next week, understanding how it works, what it can do. Um, but if you want to see what's possible, go and check out this, this demo site. It's, it's really, really exciting to me. All right. Thank you all for joining. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your Thursday, the rest of your week. Um, ooh, ooh, Adrian mentions next Thursday is a holiday in the U.S., that's a great point. Um, hmm. So maybe we won't do it next Thursday. Maybe we'll wait. Are the US folks around the following Thursday, Adrian? Just give me a, a nod. Okay. So maybe we'll maybe we'll push it out to next Thursday because I always forget about Thanksgiving. Uh, it is Thanksgiving, right? Um, okay. So so that's a that's a very valid point. So I will I will push it out to the following week. This is one of the other nice things because I'm so focused on the learning pathways. I don't have to do a workshop every week. So I can take a skip for Thanksgiving next week, which is perfect. So I'll push it out for, for next week. Um, and, and we'll see from there. Um, Valerie had a question around um, the best software to do prototypes for an API. Valerie, my personal preference for that is a, is a piece of software called Postman. Um, uh, POS, I hope this is what you're asking me, but I use Postman for doing any kind of API testing and API prototypes. Uh, so if that's what you're looking for, I recommend checking that out. It's at postman.com. Um, great. Otherwise, folks, then I won't see you next week, Thursday. Those of you in the US, please enjoy your Thanksgiving. Um, I will I will have a big meal on your behalf that evening. How about that? <laughs> um, and then I'll see you again in two weeks' time. Have a lovely rest of your Thursday and the rest of your weekend. And uh, great. Have a good one. Bye.